It is a rare study of a people who battle against terrible odds and finally emerge victorious. In this story, the Ukrainians may be said to be representative of all the immigrant groups that came to Canada about the same time. It is a genuinely Canadian epic because what it contains is part of Canadian history, which is not written with letters of blood in the fields of battle, but rather where man struggles for the sustenance of God's creatures and where the only thing tamed and laid low is the rigidity of nature and its laws. There too are heroes, but they are the unsung ones, the unproclaimed ones, whose only monument is the memory of them and their superhuman labor that remains in the minds of grateful and respectful generations that follow. In 1891, two young Galician men from the village of Nabilyu, Ukraine, left their homes and families and set sail for Canada to prospect for a new life for themselves and their people. Their names were Ivan Pilipiu and Vasil Eleniak. These two men were the forerunners of a wave of Ukrainian emigration that was to alter the course of history in the Canadian West. <laughs> И у нас есть страта. Четверо нас было, Боже, не пехли. Ну, не можно говорить. А не было ничего. Земля, это, скажем, по приемницу, по приводу, то дуже добра была, але была и такая, что не урожайная. Але это то, Боже, нас четверо нас было, то я не знаю, если, если было три морды, то в земле не было. И то там, там, кушник, он там, кушник. Такие же те были. In the old country, uh, after Grandpa got married, and they had, by this time they had two children, Grandma went out in the field to cut barley for the landlord. For every hundred head of barley that she cut, she got ten. And Grandfather came out to see what she was doing, how she was doing out in the field, and he saw this. He says to her, this is the last time that you'll be cutting barley and working so hard for so little. He heard from the Germans, or learned from the Germans, that the land was available in Canada for next to nothing, and he would be able to get free uh, roughly 113 morgues, which is 160 acres. This was what induced him more than anything else, because they were in dire need of land, in dire need of something for a living. Ivan Pilipi uh, lived in the, in the village of Nibeliu, uh, which was under the um, uh, Austro-Hungarian Empire. And uh, <clears throat> they were a minority people within the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and they, they were subject to economic, political, uh, social and religious repression and uh, they could only have so much land because Galicia was um, overpopulated. And so uh, uh, Ivan Filippo began to think of, uh, of another country and so on, and he had heard of uh, John Krebs, or he knew of him, and he knew that he was in Canada. So he wrote him um, a letter, and uh, in six months, apparently, he got a reply back saying that there was land available in Canada and told uh, Ivan Pilipi to come out. 
My granddad, he applies to get to Canada. Well, it was America, they called it. He couldn't get it on Pelepiu, so he says Pelepiuski. That's class. a Polish name. And same with Il Eleniak. It wasn't Eleniak, it was Iliak. Iliak. That's a Polish name. That's how he got across. The two of them uh, decided to come together, and they uh, eventually got to uh, Hamburg, and they sailed from from Hamburg, Germany, that is. They, they sailed on the steamship Oregon, and then they arrived in Canada, in Montreal, on September 7th, 1891. So they were in the new country, and uh, that was the start of the adventure. Alipiu and Eleniak went first to Winnipeg and stayed at the immigration hall until they were able to find work. They both spoke German and were hired by German Mennonite farmers near Gretna, Manitoba, to help with the harvest. Eleniak stayed on after the harvest, and Ivan Pilipiu set out alone to prospect farmland further west, traveling as far as Calgary. When he felt he had seen enough, he decided to return to Nobiliu for his family and to tell the villagers about the possibilities of a new life in Canada. He began to talk freely and, uh, and that, and uh, said that Canada was, had possibilities for the people, that there was free land available, that they would have to pay $10 and get 160 acres of land, which was the homestead. And he uh, told the people to, to come to Canada, and the Austrian authorities warned him and so on, but he still uh, kept on talking. And then they actually uh, uh, came and uh, arrested Grandpa and took him to a place called Stanislao where they had the, the, the trial, you might say, uh, such as it was. They couldn't find anything against Grandpa, but uh, out of that he spent about a month in jail, I understand. Well, he says that people, you go, you leave here and you go away because there's lots of land and everything, you see. And then you leave here and go to Canada. And then that's why he was being reported for that Pelipo. See? And what happened to uh, And him? people, well, you see, you listen and you, they go. You see, you, uh, this first satyr start to go. So my dad went and he says he, he, he talked to Pelipo through the bars. And he says, where shall I go? I want to go to Canada. Where, where shall I go? He's, uh, he says, you go Edmonton. That's, he mentioned that was Edmonton. He says, Edmonton. So my dad filed up the ticket to Edmonton. Ivan Pilipiu's description of Canada influenced a number of his fellow villagers. The promise of Vilni Zemli, free land and hope for a better life, gave them the courage to leave. My dad was a shepherd shepherd in Carpathian Mountain and they all used to play flute there and this is the the song that he played <laughs> My father was Nikola Tiskowski, he was the first of Ukrainian that came to South Side in Edmonton with the whole family, 1892. Imagine them going not knowing where to go from old country and my mom, she had her, she had a sister and her mom down there and when she left her she knew she, that she's not going to come back again and, and but she had to go. Edmonton was a little town. Once one store was on the south side and one store on the north side and 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 a, and a brewery and police barracks that's all there was of edmonton and they had there was no bridge they had to go through the ferry across the river so my father he was he couldn't read or write and he couldn't speak english nor only one language ukrainian so he came down here Whatever they told him his name, he would say the name, and and nobody could uh, uh, repeat that name the same way the name Tichkovsky. So whatever they wrote him, he took the name. The family was uh, Anna was the oldest, and then there was Mary, and then and then there was George, John, and Bill. Bill was three years old when he came to Canada, 
And then Mike was born here. He was the first Ukrainian boy that was born in Alberta. I, Peter, was born in a potato patch where mama was hoeing the potatoes. And she had me there and she brought me into the house and she tied up the cord and made and bat me and put me in a crib. And when dad came from the field that he was working, she says to my dad, she says, go and take a look, you got another farmer. <laughs> Nikola Tichkovsky filed a homestead near what is now Scottford, Alberta in 1892 and lived for two years with his wife and five children in an old trapper's dugout. In 1894, when the first group of Nabilu families arrived and filed adjacent homesteads in the Edna area, about 64 kilometers east of Edmonton, Tichkowski canceled his Scotford homestead and moved to Edna to be with his people. The Edna settlement founded by this small group of Galician immigrants from Nabilu became the core of the first and eventually largest settlement of Ukrainian pioneers in Canada. Some of the names in that first group include Mikhailo, Nikola, and Fedor Melnik, Mikhailo Pulishi, Vasil Fenyak, and Ivan Polipiu, the instigator, who eventually arrived in Canada after his release from jail. Vasil Elenyak went back to Nabilu for his wife and children and then returned to Gretna, Manitoba to work four more years for the Mennonites. Then in 1898, he too joined his fellow villagers in the Edna settlement, filing a homestead near what is now Chipman, Alberta. The beginning of mass emigration to Canada in 1896 can be largely attributed to the influence of Dr. Joseph Olescu, a professor of agriculture in Galicia. He was deeply concerned about the plight of Ukrainian peasants, as many were being enticed by ruthless travel agents to go to Brazil and Argentina to work on plantations like slaves. He corresponded with immigration authorities in Canada to promote immigration, and he made a trip to Canada to investigate conditions visiting many of the Ukrainian homesteaders in the Edna Star Settlement. Olescu wrote about his trip in a pamphlet entitled O Emigrazi, about emigration. My father brought a book, a, a little pamphlet that jo, uh, jo, Dr. Joseph Olescu wrote in November of uh, 1895. So he was very much interested in, in that book, and especially in the, uh, in the free land. Mostly it, it was because at that time people were so very pressed, so very unsatisfied un, 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 un that they used, uh, used to run away to Brazil and to Argentina. And this, uh, this uh, uh, inspiration went through that run away from here, run away, uh, there, there must be uh, somewhere better land than this. So uh, when the father uh, got this book, he was very much impressed. And Dr. Olescu, in the meantime, organized a group, a sort of a select group that he figured, uh, that he envisioned would make good settlers. Father mentions that there were about 30 families consisting of about 80 uh, people, uh, more or less, that uh, were on the f in the first group. And it was a fortunate group because they had uh, a, ch a choice to select good land and they were, they were pretty well treated, uh, although it was very isolated, but they were well treated by the authorities. When, uh, when they stayed over the night, or stayed over that first night, uh, Mr. Halko did not move very far away, but he selected his quarter just across, uh, across the intersection. He was a, a farmer plus a carpenter by trade, and when he saw the stand of spruce at this intersection and, and the surrounding area, he said, But that was it. He was not going to move out of this area. And that's where they located their 
selected their land. Kitty Corner from Halco's, uh, Mr. Sauka selected his quarter. Uh, bordering east of uh, his quarter was my uncle's homestead, Cost, selected his. My father selected the, the one bordering to the south. And Mr. Lacusta, the one bordering my dad's homestead to the west. So they were all settled very closely together. This first group of Alescu's hand-picked settlers who arrived in May 1896 chose their homesteads a few kilometers east of the Edna Star Settlement, an area which later became known as Vostok. Within the next few years, much of the available land in the area was being homesteaded by Ukrainian families. They traveled in wagons over the old Victoria Trail and settled in adjacent farmlands. I uh, remember only when we came uh, to La Custa. That could have been in, in, in two days or three days later when we left uh, Strathcona because it's the uh, Strathcona that, we, that the uh, immigration uh, house was, that we were there for a while till we uh, settled to go. And uh, I remember when uh, our uh, uh, wagon stopped by the house of uh, Ivan Lacusto. Now it was raining, before it was raining very hard, and we were wet in, in the wig, uh, wagon. We were covered with something in there that we were uh, under like a, a, a tent. It wasn't a tent. It must have been the uh, home blankets. So the wagon stopped and Mrs. Um, uh, Lacusta was throwing the water of, uh, with a shovel uh, over the uh, threshold because the, 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 the uh, roof leaked. And uh, I remember she wasn't very happy that we came here because uh, we had to stop, we have to uh, stop there. And we were not going to, to go anywhere. And I know that they wouldn't let us go anywhere. We kn they knew that they had to take us in and uh, feed us and uh, warm us because at that time it's such that they cared for each other very much just like their own family. Uh, so we landed to stay over winter at uh, 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 journeys. These journeys were very good people just like all of the, but they were exceptionally somehow. And uh, though they had one room house, there were 10 people in, in, in that house, uh, 10 people of us. After uh, uh, when we lived uh, there for seven months, uh, they became like like very near family for whole for their whole life. In that winter, uh, hard hard to go around, they managed to uh, get the uh, the the homestead w w which they uh, found uh, before before the snow. Then in the springtime, I remember when they brought us to those two homesteads. That must have been the middle or the last part in June. My father and uh, Gregorashuk were starting to make the burday. That burday is similar to uh, Indian TP, but quite long. They, they were making for two families. And uh, they had it finished in one day, uh, two men, and, uh, and one woman and uh, my, my brother Alec and John. But uh, the very unforgettable thing is that we had very many mosquitoes. Mosquitoes were such that it was hard to, to live with. How long we lived? Not very long, because after they built that, both of the men started to make their own houses on, a, on each uh, uh, homestead which was very, uh, very near, in very uh, close uh, neighborhood. By uh, winter, they had their whole houses. The main food from the garden was potato. Potatoes always is needed with every meal. 
and uh, the uh, and the cabbage when the sauerkraut made into sauerkraut, mm -hmm. and and uh, of course the bread, the 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 the, the main thing was the, the flour to have a flour, and they were the two of them the first uh, two families that uh, left the village Tulva. When they were going, the people uh, around, when they were bidding them farewell, they said to my father, you, uh, uh, illiterate, you write us all the truth about Canada. We want to know. And they had a very big uh, uh, faith that father will do that. And father felt very big uh, obligation to to write them faithfully about Canada so he did I remembered when he was uh, settled in in 1900 uh, he took uh, some of the soil in a little bag and wrote all about the Canada and with that soil he sent to uh, to Tuluva and I remembered with uh, the people from old country that uh, said uh, what influence that, that letter made on, on them. So they began to arrive by the hundreds and thousands, lured by the prospect of free land and freedom from oppression. The Galicians, Bukovinians, Ruthenians, all eventually calling themselves Ukrainian. Some were financially prepared, others nearly destitute on arrival. Many went no further west than Winnipeg, but large numbers settled in east-central Alberta among their countrymen, and in similar settlements in Saskatchewan and Manitoba. Between 1891 and 1910, 200,000 Ukrainian immigrants settled in Canada's parklands and prairie regions the largest settlement of Ukrainian people outside of their homeland. In Alberta, the Ukrainian community at Edna Star, extending approximately 15 square kilometers, grew to encompass over 53 townships, an area of about 112 kilometers east and west, and 64 kilometers north and south, over 7,000 square kilometers. The reaction to these strangely dressed newcomers was mixed. I think a stalwart peasant in a sheepskin coat, born on the soil whose forefathers had been farmers for ten generations, with a stout wife and half a dozen children is good quality. The southern Slavs are probably the least promising of all the material that could be selected for nation building. That they are not the most desirable immigrants is made evident by a glance. They are not a people that are wanted in this country at any price. It will surprise many of the people who are doing so much kicking against Galician and Russian settlers coming into the country to learn that those of the same class who came only three years ago today have from 30 to 70 acres under cultivation. Comfortable houses, good stables and good fencing. They are all well pleased with the country, are good workers and will prove good settlers. Give them time. In spite of opposition, mass emigration continued, and by the early 1900s, the thatch-roofed, plastered, and whitewashed Ukrainian homestead became a familiar sight on the prairie landscape. It was built from logs and plaster and a sod roof and no floor, two, two rooms, like bedroom and, li and living and kitchen room together. Wood stove we burned, and it was... It was warm, small room, it was all plastered, good around and everything, it was warm. The log buildings were plastered with a clay straw mixture, which served well as insulation, and plastering was usually done by the women. 
My mother was going to, for 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 Phoenix to to pay them back for for renting their um, uh, garden. They she had to go and uh, plaster their uh, buildings that they were making because the buildings were needed very much all all the time, and all of that is had to be made of uh, of the material that is around of logs and uh, and plastered with uh, with the mud that's all that they knew how to make and they knew it uh, and, and they did it, did it very well very nicely it was women that always did did the plastering and uh, i stayed at home when father went hunting and mother went uh, uh, gray uh, plastering and i was left always at home myself i used to make a uh, uh, many stories of my own and I thought that I'm right there in, in the story mm -hmm. so I wasn't uh, very uh, very lonely in the earliest years of settlement before their farms were cleared and became productive many of the Ukrainian homesteaders had to find seasonal work to support their families Across the prairies, the expanding railway lines were being built largely by immigrant farmers. After he came and he left on the star with his, with his dad, and then he went to work like uh, towards Calgary on a railroad, and he had a camp there, he stood in the camp like they were working for dollar a day, and they deduct 25 cents or every day for for room and board. Oh, mostly, you know, all these pioneers, for first first of all, they go to work in the railroad. That's only the job they could get, you know, because the, there was no railway, like, for instance, from Edmonton to the east, there was no railway yet. Our fathers, they had hard times, but they trying to better us, you know, and that's what it was. The pioneer Ukrainian woman also bore a particularly difficult burden in the early years of settlement. With her husband away working, sometimes for months at a time, she had to assume full responsibility for work on the homestead, usually with several small children to support and protect. Childbirth was often a woman's own responsibility unless she was able to find a midwife or neighbor to help her. When she ran short of bread, a woman sometimes had to walk miles to the nearest store making two trips to carry home a hundred pounds of flour. The loneliness, worry for her absent husband, concern for her children's survival, and an ever precarious food supply made day-to-day -day existence a desperate struggle. The harshness and isolation of the settlers' new life was made even more difficult without the spiritual nourishment that they had known in their homeland. They were a deeply religious people, and the traditions and customs that were part of their religious services were the foundations of their very existence. In the brutal conditions, infant mortality was high, and unbaptized children were buried with no religious ceremony in unmarked graves. This was very hard on the families, as it was the belief that the unbaptized were not promised salvation. There were marriages to be performed and funerals to be conducted, and there were no priests available of their religious denomination. In April 1897, Father Nestor Dmitri, a Ukrainian Greek Catholic priest, visited the Edna colony and held Easter services in the Limestone Lake schoolhouse on Ivan Polipiu's homestead. He spent several days hearing confessions, baptizing children, blessing Easter Pascha, and consecrating the cemetery. Encouraged by this first visit and a subsequent visit in the fall, the settlers joined together to build a church in the Greek Rite at Star. Logs were cut and hauled, and by summer 1898 the church was completed. But among the people, there were religious differences. And in the new land, where the settlers were free to practice the religion of their choice, these differences eventually resulted in bitter division. In the country where they lived and where they uh, migrated, uh, emigrated from in Austria, it was uh, the only religion that was allowed there, or the faith, was the Greek 
and Roman Catholic faiths. So when these people my, uh, emigrated to Canada, they were looking for more land, they were getting away from oppression, they were looking for freedom, not only of speech, but of religion. And this is where they were, when they found that there was freedom of religion, they, many of them that were more, uh, that were interested, wanted to revert back to the religion of their ancestors, their forefathers. In July 1897, Reverend Kamyov and Vladimir Alexandrov, a priest and deacon of the Russian Orthodox faith, visited the Ukrainian community at Vostok and Edna Star and held a religious service on Theodore Nemirsky's homestead. On the, my father's homestead, on a Sunday, they, uh, they held the first service in this area. This was the first Russian Greek Orthodox service that was held on Canadian soil. Uh, there were about, my dad mentioned in his autobiography, that there were about 380 people attending the service. And uh, many, that day, many renounced the uh, supremacy of the Pope and uh, joined the uh, Russian Greek Orthodox Church. And uh, this place has been observed as a holy site because if I remember, uh, remember correctly, my father said that the priests, when they held a service, it's a custom in our religion, to, uh, when you consecrate a place, you place uh, a relic, which is uh, part of a bone of a saint. And this, there is a, a relic buried there in that site. The visit by the Russian Orthodox missionaries marked the beginning of a religious political dispute between the Catholic and Orthodox settlers in the Edna Star colony that would bitterly divide the Ukrainian people for many years, turning neighbor against neighbor, even brother against brother. In 1899, a young Russian Orthodox missionary by the name of Yakyu Korchinsky arrived with his wife in Vostok to live among the people. He was enthusiastic and well-liked and the settlers were happy to finally have a priest among them to serve their religious needs. As a dedicated missionary, Korchinsky was responsible for many Greek Catholic settlers converting to Orthodoxy. But you know, Korchinsky made a uh, no little uh, mistake. They went to confess, you see, and before, you know, he going to give, uh, you know, you know, you have know, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. he put, you know, gospel in the, in the center of the church and says swear from from the pop popsky blue you you see from the pope you see swear you see on on the orthodoxy and uh, all the people you know was here like that and they just all went away you see finished you see that's what he made the mistake and that's what you see to no trouble. My mom and, and my dad was going to go orthodox, so he came to church and they were changing to orthodox. And they, while they were changing, they were swearing that they're going to be orthodox as long as they live when their children is going to be orthodox. And, and I was a young little boy with dad. At that I don't remember, but that told me I was a little boy standing there and he took me by the hand and he says, come on, mom, let's go. And mom says, well, come on. He says, don't worry. He came outside and he says, he, he points on me. He says, what do you know what he's going to be when he grow up, whether he be Catholic? He says, I'm not sweating for that. The Ukrainian community at Star was now bitterly divided into two religious factions. Ukrainian Greek Catholics who wished to keep the religion they had known in Galicia under Austria and the Russian Orthodox converts opposed to the supremacy of the Pope and domination by Roman Catholicism. The church that they had built together at Star became the focal point of dispute. In July 1900, Reverend Ivan Seklinsky, a Greek Catholic priest, arrived to serve at Star and consecrate the newly finished church. In February 1901, Father Korchinsky from Vostok held the first Russian Orthodox service in the Star Church, and in April he held another. 
Hostility and physical confrontation between the Catholics, led by Zeklinski, and the Orthodox, led by Korczynski, finally erupted on Easter Sunday, 1901, when both groups arrived for Easter services. Police were forced to lock the church doors, and for the next four years, the Star Church stood empty, as a vicious and costly legal battle was waged through the courts and eventually to the Privy Council in London. In 1905, the Orthodox won the decision in London, claiming the Star Church as their own, and the Greek Catholics eventually built another church for themselves at Star Peno. But the hostility between the two groups was deep-rooted and had a lasting effect on the people. Well, it did, it did quite a bit, you know, because they were all from the same village, and yet, you know, they were divided by religion then. One says we're that, and the other says we're not. My grandfather, he was right in the first place, but they just won't, they won't, they won't believe him. They believe they're, they're priests. <laughs> well, what did your grandfather, how, what did you Well, he said, we're all the same. I say, he, he told them. He says, out there we didn't know, but here we know who we are. Mm. You know? So that's what, it cost him, what, $110,000 or $120,000? Those lost their life savings and everything. They lost. So. Were the people then after that, uh, they had been friends before, neighbors before, yeah. after? Yeah, and re relatives too. <laughs> they just went, you know, one against the other, mm -hmm. on, account of, uh, on account of religion. Eventually, three distinct religious denominations were established in the Ukrainian settlements. Ukrainian Greek Catholic, Russian Greek Orthodox and Ukrainian Greek Orthodox. Even with their sometimes fierce desire to retain the religious and cultural heritage of their forefathers, the Ukrainians were also starting to identify themselves within the context of a new land. On September 1st, 1905, Alberta, formerly a part of the Northwest Territories, became a province of Canada. To celebrate the occasion, Prime Minister Sir Wilfrid Laurier came to Edmonton to bestow his blessing and speak directly to immigrant settlers. I see everywhere hope. I see everywhere calm resolution, courage, enthusiasm to face all difficulties, to settle all problems. We do not anticipate and we do not want that any individuals should forget the land of their origin or their ancestors. Let them look to the past, but let them also look to the future. Let them look to the land of their ancestors, but let them also look to the land of their children. In the land of their children, education was a high priority, and the Ukrainian settlers, many of whom were illiterate from the old country, were determined that their children should have the educational opportunities that they had lacked. Often the older children did not go to school, either because there were no schools built or their help was needed in those desperate early years of homesteading. But the younger children were usually able to attend school for several years. Among the earliest schools in the Edna Star area was the Limestone Lake School, organized in 1896. It was built on the southwest corner of Yvonne Polipu's homestead. I remember yet when she was... Uh, uh, out of logs, but it was already had siding on it. But they had this country schools, three windows on one side, three windows on the other side, it was this way here. And that was it. A little porch where you, <laughs> shelves where you left your lunches, and stove, belly stove, and that's it, desks. And one room? Yeah, one room. After Alberta became a province in 1905, the number of schools in the Ukrainian settlements increased rapidly. By 1916, every immigrant child had the opportunity to attend public school, and over 60 schools were given names reminiscent of Ukraine. Bukovina, Vladimir, Luyu, Svoboda, Yaroslav, Prozvita, Kalush. But in spite of the names, English was the compulsory language in school, and the Ukrainian children had to learn quickly. 
And the students uh, had to speak English in the school? Uh, they were expected to, yes. But outside you would speak Ukrainian, mm -hmm. you know, and that. But in the school, well, certainly you uh, had to speak, are expected to speak English. Some of them could uh, speak no English at all. They, all they knew was Ukrainian because Ukrainian was spoken at home. Like at our place, we always spoke Ukrainian. So I just uh, I knew a few words of English when I started school. I just had to pick up the English. The first generation of Canadian-born Ukrainian children often acted as translators for their parents, thus beginning the gradual, inevitable process of assimilation. The Ukrainian people were slowly becoming part of the Canadian cultural mosaic. But with the onset of World War I, as Canada went to war with Austria-Hungary, the immigrants, who had not acquired British subject status, were labeled enemy aliens with questionable national loyalties. Some were placed in internment camps throughout the country until the end of the war. It would take many more years for the Ukrainians to be accepted by the English majority in Canada. In the winter of 1918, Northern Alberta was struck suddenly and unexpectedly by a flu epidemic of often fatal proportions. Few immigrant families escaped the deadly effects. Their places it swept up the whole family. And I was a young boy at that time. I used to, to dig many graves. And my older sister, Anna, died on flu. That's out of the family. That's all that died out of our family. And the people were so dying that they didn't have no time. They were to, to take him into, there was only one undertaker at Le Mans, and he had a building there and they were hauling them that fast. He had boys, two, three boys hauling that in there. My brother and my brother got 106 degrees. And Dr. Ross says, put him all around ice. You see, uh, around the, see, my, my brother. And I says, I, uh, I didn't know, you see. I said, maybe that ice, maybe no good. And Dr. Ross said, if you know better than I, why did you bring, bring him here? You see? And I didn't know that ice for the, uh, you know, fever is, is helping. I didn't know. My mother used to cook, cook soup, you know, pot, and wrap it up, and I'd go to one neighbor, leave some soup for them, go to another one, soup and build fires. Go to, I had four, five, five families to look after. Because they were all just, they couldn't they, they, get out of They couldn't get out, but none of them died. Kind of passed through it. Not one. And then go to another one, then supper, again. Well, what the heck, a kid, ten, ten years old. Is it true that garlic helps? Yes, <laughs> that even even as they say, some English people will thinking garlic is not so good, but afterwards we notice that they even use it. <laughs> oh yeah, they, they, you know, at first when they come, they said those wild. They didn't call them anything but wild people, and then garlic stinkers. That was the first <laughs> thing they knew, and when the flu came around, they were after garlic. On horseback, they were traveling all over. You got garlic, you got garlic. <laughs> yeah, sure. Because it helped. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. It kept the flu away. In spite of the hardships and setbacks of the early years of settlement, the Ukrainians had brought with them to the new land a rich heritage of music, song, and dance. Music was a means of both grieving and celebrating life and it always served to bring the people together as a community. Weddings were always a cause for celebrations, which often lasted several days. The energy and intensity of their music and dance was also reflected in their determined effort to succeed as farmers, and most homesteaders did eventually prosper in the new land. Then Daddy said he, he, he improved his farm pretty good, you know, he had three sacks. Uh, about three sacks of land, you know, and we used to, with the horses, we used to seed for five, six hundred acres with horses only. About 25 horses working all day. We bought 1924 first thrashing machine, our own machine. Before we were like in the, in the company, maybe there were 20 shareholders, 
sti big steamer machine and they go around and, and try it. But about 1994, we bought our own machine and we had our own six teams and hired uh, six men, you know, for hauling stooks to the machine. And uh, the boys, we were, John was running the machine and we were around it, you know, like our own outfit. The prosperity that the Ukrainian settlers began to enjoy was reflected in their later homes. Many were built by Ukrainian craftsmen and represented a unique blending of Ukrainian and Canadian architecture. The third house of pioneer Ivan Filipiu was one of the homes chosen for preservation at the Ukrainian Cultural Heritage Village near Edmonton. Uh, we used to stop quite often after school and, uh, and Grandma would give us lunch, whatever she had. She was a generous person. It was, uh, uh, a big enough house, although downstairs there were just the two large rooms. The kitchen was on the east, although the kitchen had a bed. And they had the basic furnishings in the, in the, in the kitchen. You see a stove, uh, a table, cupboard, you know, and so on. To the west was, was the bedroom where, where Grandpa and, and Grandma slept, although Grandma wasn't too well already. Ivan Filipiu died of a tragic fall. He remained for many years largely unrecognized as an important leader and forerunner of Ukrainian immigration and settlement of Western Canada. Vasil Eleniak, Polipiu's companion and fellow prospector in 1891, lived to the age of 97, long enough to be honored as a pioneer of Ukrainian settlement in Canada. In January 1947, at the National Citizenship Ceremonies in Ottawa, Prime Minister Mackenzie King presented Vasil Eleniak with his Canadian citizenship as representative of Ukrainian Canadians. Grandpa was very, very firm in what he said. He was uh, very elated. He says, I'm very proud to receive this uh, certificate. He says, but I am, I don't want this glory. He says, the, I shall, this glory should go to the people that follow me. He says, they are the ones that will be reaping the benefits of what I have started. <laughs> 